Welcome to Full Spectrum Science. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. On April 8th, 2024, the Exploratorium and our NASA partners will webcast a total solar eclipse visible in Mexico and the United States from Texas to Maine. Many people have seen partial eclipses, but very few have experienced the grandeur of a total solar eclipse, like you see here. A total solar eclipse happens when the moon passes between the sun and the earth. Sounds simple, but there are a few factors we'll discuss. To see the full total eclipse, you'll need to be within the path of the shadow, somewhere within the red line on this diagram, also called the path of totality. If you're outside the red line, you'll only see a partial eclipse. The yellow dot is the location of maximum eclipse duration, which is very near to one of our observing sites in Torreon, Mexico. Let's look a bit closer. Here's the path of totality from northern Mexico all the way across the United States. This eclipse map is available from our good friends at the Scientific Visualization Studio at NASA Goddard. We had a great American eclipse in 2017, we hope you had a chance to see that one, and a little over six and one half years later, we get another one. The path of totality passes through Mexico into Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, Ohio, New York, a bit of New Hampshire and Vermont, and finally into Maine, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Let's zoom in on where we'll be observing the eclipse. We chose two locations to assure we can bring the eclipse to you. Mother Nature does not always cooperate. More on this in a bit. We'll first see the eclipse in Torreon, Mexico, and then, about 13 minutes later, our primary site in Junction, Texas will experience totality. So, during our webcast, you will hopefully experience two total eclipses. A note about the times you see on this map. Mexico, smartly in my opinion, does not use daylight savings time, so the times in Mexico and the U.S. do not differ by slightly over one hour. Torreon is on Central Standard Time, and Junction is on Central Daylight Time. The Umbra, or shadow of the sun, first passes over our location in Torreon, Mexico. Here, the partial phases of the eclipse start at 11 a.m. and ends at 1.41 with the mid and maximum eclipse at 12.19 local time. Totality at this location lasts for 4 minutes and 8 seconds. The shadow then moves along to our other primary location in Junction, Texas. I'm also showing the altitude of the sun, 0 degrees is the horizon and 90 degrees is directly overhead, and the azimuth of the sun. Azimuth is measured from due north, 0 degrees, around the horizon in an eastward direction. So altitude and azimuth give you how far up and how far around you look for the sun. Again, note these times are central standard time, since Mexico does not participate in daylight savings time. Now let's look at the local circumstances for Junction, Texas. The eclipse starts here at 1214 and ends at 255 central daylight time, with the mid and maximum eclipse at 134. The total part of the eclipse lasts for 3 minutes and 10 seconds in junction. Let's look at the C1 through C4, or contact 1 through contact 4, and see what that means. First contact, or C1, is when the moon first starts to cover the face of the sun. I've momentarily brightened the moon so we can see it, but it's really invisible since we're looking at the dark side of the moon against the blinding surface of the sun. Second contact, or C2, occurs when the moon just fully covers the disk of the sun. Third contact, or C3, 
is the point when the moon is about to start exiting the solar disk. Finally, we arrive at fourth contact, or C4, when the moon fully leaves the sun's surface. I've once again artificially brightened the moon to make it visible. The eclipse is officially over at this point, and the moon happily continues along its way. For folks who stay at home and watch it from the Exploratorium, here are the timings for the partial eclipse visible there. Viewers will see a maximum magnitude 0.44 partial eclipse. When we can, we webcast the eclipse from two widely separated locations. This is to assure our viewers they'll be able to see the eclipse in spite of what Mother Nature may throw at us. And Hopefully, we won't be clouded out. This panorama shows you the Madras, Oregon site for the 2017 eclipse. It takes a lot of people and equipment to bring these eclipses to you live. We plan these exhibitions well in advance and take into account historical weather records. On this map, the colors represent the average cloud cover for April 8th. Blue means normally clear skies. Green means a 50% chance for clouds, and red means normally clouded over for that day. The path of totality is also outlined in red. We are viewing from here in Torreon, Mexico, and here in Junction, Texas. Let's look closer at each of these locations. You can see here, in Torreon, Mexico, the cloud cover on April 8th is no more than about 20%, giving us very good chances of seeing the total eclipse. This chart shows the average cloud cover as we follow the path of totality from out in the Pacific Ocean through Mexico until it hits Texas. As you can see, we chose the Torreon location carefully for its weather and the fact that it's a fairly large city with available support facilities. You never know when you might need some supply and a hardware store is handily nearby. Junction, Texas, while being easier for us travel-wise, is a bit dicier weather-wise. It's still better than further along the path of totality. Here's the average cloud cover along the path of totality from Texas to Illinois. Junction is showing about 45% chance of cloud cover, so still better than a 50-50 chance of seeing totality, about the best in the U.S. In Torreon, we'll be webcasting from the site of the Torreon Planetarium, and we're very much looking forward to working with their staff and public. Check out their website and their programs. In Junction, Texas, we'll be working on the campus of Texas Tech University. This is our primary site where we'll produce the entire webcast from. This is a simulation of what we'll pretty much see in both webcast locations, except the sky will be blue and without stars until totality. This is sped up 300 times. The moon covers the sun, showing us all the partial phases. We'll get three or four minutes of totality, and then all the partial phases in reverse, revealing the face of the sun again until the completion of the eclipse at fourth contact. We'll go over this again in more detail in a bit. First, Let's get some perspective about the sizes and distances of the Sun, Moon, and Earth. The Earth is 3.6 times the size of the Moon. Placed on the same slide, the sizes look like this. However, we don't have the distance between the Earth and the Moon shown properly. To do that, we have to change the scale a bit. Now, you can see why it's not really practical to have both the size and distance scaled properly in books and illustrations. The moon is, on the average, 240,000 miles from the Earth. That's about 30 Earth diameters between them. 
I can show you the relative sizes of the Sun and Earth, but I can't space them apart properly on the screen. The Earth is about one one hundredth the diameter of the Sun, and it orbits over one hundred solar diameters distant. Let's try to make a scale model again. If the Sun were the size of a regulation basketball, nine and a half inches in diameter, the Earth would be a minuscule dot about the size of a candy sprinkle less than one-tenth of an inch in diameter, orbiting 85 feet from the basketball. The Earth is invisibly small on this slide, less than a pixel in diameter. That's why they call it space. Eclipses are all about shadows, so I think it's important to take a look at them. Let's state the obvious here. The sizes and distances of the Sun, Moon, and Earth in these diagrams are wildly out of scale and are made this way to demonstrate the phenomena we're discussing. The Sun gives off light from every point on its surface, and this light moves out in all directions. But let's simplify that a bit and look at extremes. For example, look at light coming from just the top of the Sun. We'll put a light bulb there to represent this. Again, light from this bulb goes out in all directions, but we're only interested in the light that heads towards the Moon and Earth. Light passing the Moon is blocked and casts a shadow. Anyone in this shadow cannot see the light bulb. Now, let's look at the other side of the Sun. If we place a light bulb on the bottom of the Sun, light from this bulb will also be blocked by the Moon and cast a shadow of its own. Notice there is a darker shadow where the Moon is blocking the light from both the top and the bottom of the Sun. This is called the umbra. From the lighter parts of the shadow, you can see the light bulbs, meaning the Sun, peeking out either above or below the Moon. This lighter, partial shadow is called the penumbra. In reality, there are light bulbs all over the Sun's surface, but that doesn't change the diagram since we're looking at extremes. Notice that the umbra only touches the Earth in a very small circle I've marked in yellow. You must be within this circle to see the Sun completely blocked out and experience a total solar eclipse. If you're in the penumbra, you'll be able to see some of the Sun peaking above or below the Moon and experience a partial solar eclipse. If eclipses happen when the Moon is between Earth and Sun, at New Moon, then why don't we have an eclipse every month? As I already mentioned, we can only see a solar eclipse when the Moon is between the Earth and the Sun. That's called New Moon. Only the dark side faces us. At any other place in its orbit, we see a portion of the Moon lit by the Sun as it waxes to full Moon, right there, and wanes back to new Moon. This takes about 29 and a half days to occur. The Sun follows a path in the sky called the ecliptic. The Sun takes one year to complete a circle around the sky. Note, this is just a reflection of the Earth's motion around the Sun, not the motion of the Sun itself. The Moon's orbit is tilted five degrees to the ecliptic. The Sun and Moon are only one half of a degree in diameter, as seen from the Earth. This means that most of the time, when the Moon passes between us and the Sun, it will pass above or below the Sun's disk. Here, we see the motion of the Sun and Moon the month before our eclipse in April. See how it misses? For an eclipse to occur, both the Sun and Moon must arrive at both orbits crossing point at the same time. This point is called the node. Only then can the Moon block the Sun. Here, we see the motion of the Sun and Moon during the month of the eclipse. They both arrive at the node at the same time and we see a total solar eclipse. 
In this animation, it's very short because I've sped up time by a factor of 3,000 to make the motion of the sun and moon visible. As the moon orbits the Earth, it casts a shadow that moves across the face of the Earth. Here, you see the shadow from the 2017 Great American Eclipse. Notice that the umbra is tracing a red path behind it. You must be inside that red line, inside the path of the umbra, to see a total eclipse. Outside the line, you see only a partial eclipse. And here's what it actually looked like from NOAA's GOES-16 satellite. There are three types of solar eclipses you can observe. This is a partial eclipse. You are not on the path of the umbra center line of this eclipse and see only a part of the sun covered. Many people have seen this type of eclipse. In an annular eclipse, you're on the center line, but the moon is too far from the Earth, and or the Earth is too close to the sun, or both, and the moon's disk cannot block the entire solar disk. The moon leaves a ring, or annulus, of the sun showing. We saw this type of eclipse last year in 2023. The last and most spectacular type of eclipse is the total eclipse. Here, the moon can cover the entire disk of the sun, and we see all the special effects the sun has to offer. The diamond ring, Bailey's beads, the corona, and an eerie darkness in the middle of the day. What portion of eclipses are annular or total? Might be interesting to take a quick look at that. We'll use 5,000 years of eclipses from 2000 BCE to 3000 CE. About one third of all eclipses are partial, another third are annular, and slightly over one quarter are total. A hybrid eclipse is one that starts out or ends as annular with a central total eclipse portion. Those make up around 5% of all eclipses. Before we get to how to view the sun safely, an important question is, what is there to see? There are many ways to look at the sun. In our webcasts, we'll show you the sun seen in visible light and in the light given off by the hydrogen atom. Here's the sun seen in visible light assuming you could dim it enough to observe the surface. Notice the dark sunspots, slightly cooler regions of the sun. They're usually larger than the entire planet Earth. By the way, this is a time lapse. The sun really takes about 30 days to rotate on its axis once. If you looked at the sun in the red light given off by hydrogen, you'd get a different picture, telling you a whole new set of information. We'll also be webcasting the sun seen this way by using a special filter that only allows through a very, very narrow color range only given off by hydrogen atoms in the solar atmosphere. At the extreme violet end of the spectrum, special filters can pick out a color of light only given off by calcium atoms in the solar atmosphere. This gives a view a bit deeper into the solar atmosphere than the hydrogen alpha filter. With spacecraft above the atmosphere, you can observe the sun in extreme ultraviolet. This view was taken from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, or SDO, in orbit around the Earth. This X-ray view of the sun is a combination of three different satellite views. Each type of light lets us explore a different aspect of our star. How do we observe the sun and not harm our eyes? We don't have to worry about x-rays or extreme ultraviolet since those are filtered by our atmosphere. But we do have to worry about the intense visible and infrared light which does make it through our atmosphere. 
The easiest and cheapest way of viewing the sun safely is by using a pinhole. Here, we see Julie holding up a piece of pegboard. What you see on the screen is that each hole has produced a small image of the partially eclipsed sun. The smaller the pinhole, the sharper, but dimmer the solar image becomes. You can use your spaghetti strainer, often called a colander. Again, each hole produces an image of the sun. You can even make pinholes by crossing your fingers at right angles. Here's another example using only your hands. So far, these were all taken at the 2017 eclipse. A good leafy tree can also provide eclipse images as the sunlight filters through tiny holes in the foliage. It looks even better if you use a white screen instead of dirt to project onto. And another example of pinhole images through trees taken at a Maker Faire in San Mateo, California. If you have a small mirror ball, each tiny mirror acts like a tiny reflecting pinhole, giving you a disco sun experience. By the way, there's an actual song, Disco Sun, by Jason Emraz. You might want to check that out. If you insist on directly viewing the sun with your eyes, be sure to use an approved solar viewer, which come in several different configurations. Read the instructions printed on the viewer and follow them. Eclipses are amazing events, but not worth damaging your eyes. Be sure the filter is ISO 12312-2 or CE certified. These folks are looking through welder's glass. You must use number 14 density filters or greater, which reduce the sun's light by a factor of 270,000. Do not use filters designed for brazing. They allow through too much light. A good rule of thumb, if the sun looks too bright, it is. Don't use that filter. You may have heard you can use fully exposed and developed black and white film, but we advise against this as it depends on many factors and can easily lead to eye damage. The same goes for smoked glass. Never use sunglasses either. They don't filter enough light. Use only filters that are specifically made to observe the sun. We can't stress this strongly enough. You can use a small telescope or binocular to project an image of the sun like you see here on this screen. Do not look through the telescope or a binocular. Only look at the projection on the screen. If you use a binocular, only use one of the two lenses. Block the other. Also be aware that you could ruin your eyepiece with the concentrated sunlight passing through. Here's a closer view of a binocular projection. It's sharper and brighter than a pinhole projection. This is a specialized solar viewer called a sun spotter. Again, this uses safe projection onto a screen. Some older telescopes you may find in your attic came with a solar filter you screwed into the eyepiece. You can even find these for sale today from unscrupulous vendors. These are extremely dangerous. The big lens at the front of the telescope concentrates the sunlight and passes it through the much smaller filter where most of the energy is absorbed. The absorbed light can heat the filter to very high temperatures and it may shatter while you're observing, causing instant and permanent damage to your eye. Throw this filter away and use the projection method instead. Whenever any part of the sun's surface is exposed, you must use some form of protection. During a partial eclipse, you can never look directly at the sun. Likewise, during an annular eclipse, some of the sun's surface is always exposed. Even if you're on the center line, like you see here, you cannot view this eclipse with the naked eye. You must use some form of filtering or projection. During a total eclipse, you still have to use filters or projection during all the partial phases leading up to totality. 
only during totality is it safe to use your naked eyes. Here, you see the diamond ring effect, as the last bit of the sun disappears behind the moon. A few seconds later, as the last bit of the sun disappears, light shining through mountains and valleys on the edge of the moon breaks up into a series of uneven pieces called Bailey's Beads, named after Francis Bailey, even though they were first observed by Edmund Halley, yes, the comet guy. Close to the sun, you'll see the corona, and maybe some crimson prominences, giant eruptions of hydrogen above the sun's surface, many times the size of the Earth. The corona, or outer atmosphere, extends outward from the sun. In this longer exposure, you can see it extend out quite far. As soon as the sun peeks out from behind the moon in another diamond ring effect, you must once again use your filter or projection methods to view the rest of the eclipse until fourth contact. Sometimes clouds form after eclipses because the air gets a bit colder and you can see the partial eclipse through the clouds. The last thing I'd like to mention is that you can see eclipses from space too, now that we have spacecraft orbiting the Earth. Here's a photo of the Umbra during a total solar eclipse taken from the Russian Mir space station on August 11, 1999. Here we see several shots of eclipses caught by the Discover spacecraft as it observes the Earth from one million miles away. Here's the 2020 South American eclipse, as seen by the GOES-16 weather satellite. And from the European Meteosat weather satellite, here's the total eclipse of March 29, 2006. We viewed that one from Turkey. This is a somewhat extreme eclipse of the sun. It was caught by the stereo spacecraft, which trails the Earth in our orbit. The spacecraft was about one million miles from Earth, so the moon looks much smaller compared to the sun. I suppose one could call this an annular eclipse. However you choose to view the eclipse, whether on our webcast, or by traveling and experiencing it in person, something I highly recommend, have a safe and wonderful view of one of nature's most awesome displays. Thank you for watching this full spectrum science presentation all about eclipses. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman.